Hello and welcome everyone to lecture 33 of this series on fluids and electrolytes. This series is based on my book, Manual of Fluid Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find the book on Amazon. Follow the description below. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel. We are still on Chapter 5, Hypomagnesemia and Hypermagnesemia. Today we are going to discuss hypomagnesemia. Let's start with some definitions. We've said previously that normal serum magnesium is 1.7 to 2.6 milligram per deciliter. This is equivalent to 1.4 to 2.2 milliequivalent per liter. If we are using standard units, it would be 0.7 to 1.1 millimole per liter. Therefore, hypomagnesemia is serum magnesium less than 1.7 mg per deciliter, but we don't get significant symptoms and signs until it's below 1.2 mg per deciliter. On the other hand, hypermagnesemia is serum magnesium above 2.6 mg per deciliter, and we get significant symptoms and signs when serum magnesium exceeds 4.8 mg per deciliter, so it has to be pretty high. What about the prevalence of hypomagnesemia? Hypomagnesemia is seen in both hospitalized patients and community-dwelling subjects. On the other hand, hypermagnesemia is less common. A study, and I've referred to this study before when we talked about potassium, hypokalemia, and hyperkalemia, the Rotterdam study, it was a study in 5,000 community-dwelling subjects age 55 and older. They found hypomagnesemia defined as less than 1.2 mg per deciliter in 2.4% of individuals between 55 and 64 years of age. Now, in individuals older than 65, it was only in 1.8%. Uh, now, hypomagnesemia in the same study was associated with increased mortality, okay, increased mortality risk of 39%, so uh, 1.39, and the range was 1.06 to 1.81. Another study, a Japanese study, measured serum magnesium in 6,252 inpatients. Hypomagnesemia here, defined as less than 1.5 mg per deciliter, was seen in 2.6. Hypermagnesemia, defined as magnesium over 3.9, was seen in 0.8% of patients. Now, hypermagnesemic patients usually had impaired kidney function or uh, were women who were given magnesium sulfate in the course of preeclampsia and eclampsia. Now, if someone has impaired kidney function and then you give them antacids or cathartics that has magnesium, then truly you're going to have hypermagnesemia. Now, hypomagnesemia is common in postoperative patients in the intensive care unit. Here we have a study in 193 patients in the ICU, and hypomagnesemia defined as less than 1.5 mg per deciliter was seen in a lot in 61% of patients. How do we evaluate magnesium in the body? Now, magnesium, unlike uh, sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarb, and calcium, is not available on routine chemistry panels. You have to order it separately. As you know, the same applies to uh, phosphate. So you need to suspect it, in, and then you order it. Once you order it, it's easy because all labs will do it for you. We'll, get, we'll give you some magnesium measurement. Now, as we said before, the extracellular fluid contains only 1% of total body magnesium. And in the blood, only 0.3% of serum magnesium exists, mostly in the red blood cells. So if you have hemolysis, you can have pseudo-hypermagnesemia, the same way you would have pseudo-hyperkalemia, because the red blood cells have a lot of potassium and magnesium. Now, measurement of magnesium in a 24-hour urine is helpful in hypomagnesemia. It's not helpful in hypermagnesemia. I've said the same about potassium. If we do a 24-hour urine potassium, it helps us in hypokalemia, but we never do it in hyperkalemia. Okay, now if we do only a 12-hour collection, magnesium excretion is circadian, so it's not helpful. Now, an elevated urine magnesium means that the kidneys are wasting magnesium. On the other hand, if urine magnesium is low, it means that magnesium wasting is probably GI in origin. Now, normal urine magnesium is usually less than 12 to 25 milligrams per 24 hours. 
Now, if you have renal wasting of magnesium, such as use of diuretics, for example, then your magnesium would be over 30 milligrams per 24 hours. Actually, we use the same number of 30 for potassium wasting. What about magnesium loading test? This test, I, I'm just mentioning that for the sake of completion. Um, no one ever uses it unless it's a, a research study. Magnesium loading test or magnesium retention test was proposed to identify patients with normal serum magnesium, but when you are still suspecting hypomagnesemia. Now you give magnesium, you load the patient with intravenous magnesium or oral magnesium, such as given 7.5 grams of magnesium over eight hours. You know, like usual, those we usually give two grams. Here you are giving about four times that much. Or you could use five grams of oral magnesium, such as five grams of magnesium lactate as an oral loading. Now, if the patient excretes more than 60 to 70 percent, then they probably don't have magnesium deficiency because otherwise they would have retained the magnesium. Now, it's rarely used because you have false negatives and false positives, false negatives in diabetics and alcoholics, false positives in patients with CKD. Now, what about hypomagnesemia now? Let's talk more about it. What about the etiology? When do we see hypomagnesemia? Well, if you have dietary problems, malnutrition, patients on TPN, alcoholics. Now, redistrib redistribution meaning that magnesium goes into the cells. Okay, hungry bone syndrome is an example. When, when uh, you do, say, a parathyroidectomy, you're going to have hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia because the bone is going to reclaim all that magnesium and calcium. Now, GI causes, very common, chronic diarrhea, malabsorption, renal wasting, also very common when you give a diuretics, but there are more examples that are not as common, aminoglycosides, barter, and Gittelman syndromes. Now, I have to mention that the use of proton pump inhibitors, like when you use pentuprazole, for example, is an important cause of hypomagnesemia. We don't think a lot about it, but it's very, very common. Why? Because you have GI loss, okay, not renal, GI loss. The etiology is magnesium loss due to decreased intestinal absorption via downregulation of the TRIP-M6 channels. We talked about TRIP-M6 and TRIP-M7 channels, okay, through which you get uh, magnesium absorption in the small intestine. So if you have downregulation of these channels, well, magnesium is not going to be absorbed, so it's going to be wasted, and subsequently you have hypomagnesemia, and you may end up having also hypokalemia. So what do you do if you cannot stop the proton pump inhibitor? You just give them magnesium, oral magnesium, and then problem solved. Now, let's look at the etiology of hypomagnesemia in more detail. So, there are five causes. Dietary, okay, do we have a patient who's an alcoholic on TPN, someone malnourished? Okay, GI causes usually pretty obvious. Chronic diarrhea, laxatives, malabsorption, proton pump inhibitors, never forget that. Fistula, small bowel syndrome, not very common. Primary infantile hypomagnesemia, very, very uncommon. Nasogastric suction, you can see that definitely. Renal wasting is very common. Any diuretic, loop and thiazide will do it. Obviously, if you, if you have someone on spironolactone, this is a potassium and magnesium preserving diuretic, so you're not going to see hypomagnesemia. The diuretic phase of ATM, because the patient is urinating a lot and losing, amongst other, other things, uh, magnesium. Post-obstructive diuresis is the same way. Barter syndrome, Gittelman syndrome, you have magnesium wasting. Aminoglycosides will do it. Cyclosporin A and tacrolimus, these medications are used as part of the immunosuppressive medication in transplant patients, can cause hypomagnesemia. Now, a new cause, epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors, okay, such as cetuximab, okay, these are uh, new cancer medications, can cause hypomagnesemia. This can be a common test question, okay? So you, they give you a patient, uh, the patient is on cetuximab, and then you have maybe recalcitrant, hypokalemia. What do you do next? Well, you check magnesium, okay? Cisplatin, amphotericin B, pentamidine, foscarnet, uh, pterimer is a potassium binder. We, we did uh, a couple of lectures on potassium binders. We said pterimer not only will bind potassium, but also magnesium. Okay, you don't have this problem with the other newer potassium binder, the uh, low or uh, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate. 
Congenital or acquired tubular defects can give you hypomagnesemia. Okay, redistribution. When do you see that? Refeeding, blood transfusion, insulin also will drive magnesium and potassium into the cells, acute pancreatitis, and we talked already about hungry bone syndrome. There are endocrine causes. Now, these are not very common causes of hypomagnesemia. Uh, primary and secondary hyperaldosteronism, hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, diabetes, syndrome of inappropriate anti-hormone secretion. So what do you do? With, with electrolytes, you have to memorize the common causes, okay? Like malnutrition, TP, T, TP and alcoholism, uh, diarrhea, PPIs, laxatives, diuretics, okay, and maybe hungry bone syndrome. Then, if you come across a case where you don't know, this is why you need the book. This is why you need this video, because you need to refer to a table, okay? So there's nothing wrong with that. This is why we have references. No one is going to memorize uh, every list. And uh, I'm going to stop here, and in the next lecture, we're going to continue talking about hypomagnesemia, and we'll start with genetic hypomagnesemia. See you then.